This is Wellness by Designs and I'm your host, Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Today we're joined by Geraldine Georgiou, an accredited practicing dietitian, and today we're going to be talking about feeding your skin, nourish from within. Welcome to Wellness by Designs, Geraldine. How are you? Good, thank you, Andrew. Thanks for having me on. Great to catch up it again. Is, yeah, it's our pleasure. And might I compliment you on that incredible picture on that wall behind you? That is absolutely stunning. <laughs> thank you. It's actually a Margaret Hart. <laughs> a, a I'm Margaret hoping Hart. it's going up in value. <laughs> yeah, I think so. So, Geraldine, firstly, tell us a little bit about you. I, I said accredited practicing dietitian, but can you take us yep. through a little bit of your history, how you got to being a dietitian, and what sort of opened your mind a little bit to using yeah. nutrients? Yeah, so my, my background's been quite colourful. I've been a clinical dietitian initially in the hospital system, been a dietitian for more than two decades. And so I started off in gastro and endocrine and really looking at after people that were in their acute setting. So there was nothing about prevention at that point in my career in the early days. And then it got me thinking, well, if we know that nutrition can be therapeutic, then yes, we can look after people with like tube feeding and enteral feeding and dealing with disease processes, you know, post-surgical, could be in ICU and high dependency. And maybe start thinking, I really need to get out into the, I suppose if you think about into the battleground before hospital and be able to help people in different disease processes. So as we went along, uh, we, we developed um we first were called Reality Check, which was interesting. No one wanted one, though. But we went then into designer diets. And so designing an eating plan that's right for you, for your presenting condition and what condition we may be wanting to prevent. And so it really inspired me in looking at holistically how people's health are, in particular, still maintaining that multidisciplinary approach, working with your GP, your specialist, your allied health professional, and really be able to provide a nutritional clinical service, like I said, for your health condition. So the areas that I've really sort of got more involved in over the years have been basically hormones, weight, bowels, skin, and inflammation. And I've been very fortunate working with a lot of world leaders. So from Professor Morell in dermatology, Professor Bird in rheumatology, Professor Kidson in endocrinology, Professor Bolan in gastroenterology, and even spending some time on the Gut Health Foundation, writing their Gut Foundation cookbook, and even being lucky enough to do a bit of media work along the way with the wonderful Dr. John Darcy in the Kickstart Diet, um, that was about 15 years, and working yeah. in Food Investigators TV show, and even with the Navy. So I'm pretty colourful as a dietitian in practice uh, entirely now, but I'm very fortunate and like uh, working with Designs for Health and those therapeutic companies that are out there that can really provide that functional nutrient to support nutrition wellness is uh, I'm very privileged. Oh, um, you said Navy. What did you do with the Navy? Oh. I know. Well, interestingly... You know, as you know, Navy people have to be really fit for sea. And I was very fortunate of being involved in working with the medical team at Cuttable, which is in Sydney, and working with, so if you can imagine you've got fit, you've got in, you're going really well and you're being deployed, and then on your return, your health changes. So you do get then asked to look after your health and meet your health need to be deployable. So I've been very fortunate looking after Navy personnel and their health, as well as providing nutrition talks and presentations and even nutrition challenge programs. And even being, I thought I was sure at one time, I was on HMAS Newcastle. <laughs> but we, yeah, Hopefully you weren't uniform. straddling a gun. <laughs> <laughs> Not totally, but I was going up and down ladders in a skirt, so that was interesting. I didn't think that through, but anyhow, <laughs> but we definitely had a lot of a lot of time, and I I still see like you know Commodores, like can you believe like yeah, a, a real privilege to um, you know serve Australia really, looking after their Navy personnel. 
Well, thank you for doing that because I've got to say any any person or persons who who dedicates their time to serving this country gets my stamp of respect immediately. So thank you very much for helping them. Yeah. Good thank on you, you. Andrew. Um, so, look, you've worked with gastro, um, the Gastroenterological Society, um, mm -hmm. and you've done a lot of work with gut hormones. One of the naturopathic sort of idioms is all diseases start in the gut, which I disagree with. But certainly the gut plays a major role in present presentation and, and mitigation of certain ones. So is this what we're talking about when we're talking about feeding your skin, nourished from within? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think that we're learning a lot more about it, gut health day by day. And I think we don't realise that if you're... You know, as you know, the, the gut has more cells and more the microbiome and the DNA in our gut is even more than our whole entire body. So if you can imagine if that gets disrupted, and I'm, I'm, spe I'm speaking to already the people that will agree with this, that if our gut is not in the right biosis, so dysbiosis, we need to actually support gut nutrition. Now, we can obviously support with pre and probiotics but we also need to nourish from within to be able to promote, to promote the actual commensal bacteria that we already have to be able to help get it into the right ratios to reduce inflammation, for example. Uh, one of the skin conditions as we've been going along working, I provide dietetic service to the University of New South Wales registrars go, going into dermatology and they're learning along the way. So say, for example, you have rosacea can you believe we might think hormones, we might think they're alcoholics and they're drinking too much and they're menopausal women and they've got that adult acne, but what if they've got underlying helicobacterial pylori that's disrupted their gut microbiome and that's what we target first and take away the incursion that shouldn't be there to be able to actually help skin. So that gut axis an inflammatory process and disease process that can happen from within will definitely show in your skin. And to be able to target your gut health will be a primary area, particularly for rosacea for one. I mean, I can talk for Andrew so I'm forever, Andrew, so I'm just warning you. <laughs> but like even, for example, eczema, eczema and hives and urticaria, that's another area where we might term leaky gut and we might talk about zonulin response but we're actually talking about try and histamine response, which is another area that we look at and understanding then if we've got a systemic change that's occurring and what if we need to identify if we've got underlying celiac disease or something that's really sort of coming to the forefront is this new idea of non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which can mm. come across mm. in skin areas, rheumatology areas, many areas really, and you could be then experiencing, sadly, terrible eczema and dermatitis, just not knowing that you're not reacting to the actual gluten, you're actually reacting to the amylase trypsin inhibitor, which is another protein found in wheat, that can be then creating a systemic effect and then showing on your skin, such as dermatitis and eczema, for example. Right, okay, so I, look, I, get, I guess first off, do you now give lectures to dietitians? I think I need to. <laughs> I think you no, I need to. Yeah, I, Be I do. Because you are I, so I, way ahead of the ball. Yeah, I think I think what happens is that you've got to keep abreast with the latest research. And mm. I think just um, understanding that there is more to just a, a balanced eating plan. I'm all about balance, though, so don't get me wrong. I actually was involved with Diabetes Australia, New South Wales branch, writing the What to Eat program for Diabetes New South Wales, ACT, and just the concept of the role of glycemic load and balancing. But as you know, if you've been a practitioner, patients do want to know what to eat. And I think we're, we're quick to give a prescription of some kind if it's not from a medication point of view, but a supplement point of view. But we really do, do need to show what to eat. And I think in the realm of dietetics, we need to do more of that and we need to give people mm. a roadmap. And then we need to understand, if you think of it this way, you've got medical, nutrition, it's a triangle, by the way, lifestyle and your head. 
we need to understand how it's all working together and what bit do we need to focus on and when do we need to call in Calvary? So an right. example, even this morning, I've got a patient who's had a pretty significant surgery for Whipples and it, and what's happened now, there's been a, a body organ change and the mm. glucose response is very erratic. Now, do we just keep changing the food or do we need to intervene medically and nutritionally as well? I mean, that's an extreme case, but working with mm. the endocrinologist, showing what have we done, what, what can we what can we put as a platform? So it's like providing a platform of nutrition to allow then any further medical nutritional intervention to also work because you've got to create an even playing field. So you'll even find in the Australian Healthy Skin Diet that we might go into a bit more, but it, the idea of that was about understanding your skin, understand your anatomy, understand then what nutrients play a role, what conditions you have, the involvement of your multidisciplinary team, and then providing a, a menu plan program that you can start with to give you a good start whilst working in with your team and knowing that you're doing the right thing. Because even with designer diets, with designer eating plan, it's right for you. So we can't get it wrong. So pe people that say, I heard I'm going to do a cleanse. I heard I'm going to do 800 calorie. I heard intermittent fasting. All these things won't work if they don't know you. So really getting into the, the, the dynamics of that person's health situation and what road they've walked along. A lot of people talk uh, describe me as working like a mechanic. So I check the car and I help you drive that car and I try not to bash up the driver. Let's face it, people might speed and not drive the car very well, but we, we also know that if you've got a lemon, <laughs> we still have to tinker the car. So we've, we've yeah. got to work it through. I won't name any car dealerships that I bought a lemon from, by the way. <laughs> but, um, but at the end of the day, and if you've got so many kilometres on the clock, like we know every decade there are changes that will occur out of your control and really understanding then, well, what, when? You know, we, we all want to look good, feel good, feel good, look good. So how we yeah. can get that as well as wellness along the way is the key. Yeah, good stuff. Um, just to mention a couple of names that you mentioned before, you mentioned um, Paul Bird, rheumatologist. Yes, yes. Yeah. So now, now he's in a group of specialists that were frustrated with what was offered medically and so mm -hmm. therefore explored nutritional avenues, which is very often poo-pooed by many orthodox specialists. Um, That's right. And he so a very forward thinking man. And I so enjoyed podcasting with him some years ago. Um, so I guess to ask you that sort of same question, coming from a dietetic background, are you bound by using nutrients in food alone? Or can you choose yeah. to use judiciously, responsibly chosen accessory nutrients where appropriate? 100%. So we, as we say, you know, food first, true. However, we cool. already know and we, and we all recommend, like, for example, if you're vitamin D deficient and there's diseases that are driven by vitamin D deficiency, Crohn's, multiple sclerosis, uh, depression, <clears throat> Lupus, yeah. brain health, mood health, bone health, we're not going to say just try and get it out of a food. We have to supplement. Mm, yeah. We may even need an injection. So let's look at iron, iron infusions. I'm all for an iron infusion. I'm all about getting you there uh, better, quicker, if we can, while we fix the background issue. Yeah. And yeah, I think, right. you know, when we're in ICU in, in a hospital and say you've been in a starvation situation and we're refeeding you, there's a condition called refeeding syndrome, refeeding syndrome. that will occur. Yeah. Yeah, refeeding syndrome, and this can actually kill you if we don't monitor your potassium, your phosphate, and your magnesium carefully. And we do have to then give you, even through IV drips or oral supplementation, 
we need to top up these nutrients. It could be quite precarious for some patients and they can even develop like a tetany situation if their levels and their electrolytes electrolytes fluctuate too much. Mm. So, yes, yeah, so mm. yes, we do need to look at therapeutic nutrients for patients. You know, I was involved in the nutritional benefits of arginine and wound healing, for example, and there's so much research that supports arginine at a therapeutic dose for poor wound healing, including diabetic leg ulcers. And also um, if you've got someone bed bound and they've got um, wound healing problems from you know, being in that situation or even a burns victim, you know, um, you'll find no. in my book actually. Yeah, sorry, you go. Yep. No, well, no, I was... Keep, please continue because this is really interesting. Yeah. So another area I might work in, um, if you look at the book that I wrote, I wrote some buzz nutrients and I shared some information about, well, you know, we are going in this area. I think the danger that people have is that they may just run with the supplement rather than actually looking at the whole picture. And we know a supplement right. alone may not work as effectively or you may not be taking it at the right time, or there could be a drug nutrient interaction. So this is where you need to have, you know, a, you know, very good advice on what, when, and if it's not through a dietitian, you know, if in those that are listening, you know, pharmacists can definitely help too to know what nutrients should not be put with, you know, different nutrients. Like we used to worry about warfarin and vitamin K, for example. Um, they don't tend to use warfarin as much anymore. So I think, you know, I think it's really important that I think we need to look at nu nutrition more therapeutically. Uh, I do. And I think that we need, and we're learning, as I said, and like, for example, working with Professor Bird, what a breath of fresh air. Uh, he he actually got me to do a presentation to a whole group of colleagues about the truth about gluten sensitivity and even using a, a food change to help a disease process, not just supplementation. So I think, you know, understanding that we can be much more in the, in the fighting space of disease process rather than just saying, you know, eat better, lose weight, which is what they think dietitians do. You know, yeah. I know I had a patient yesterday, it was quite interesting, we are fixing her metabolic health for her skin and underlying insulin resistance. And I know Dr Kotze's got a big area of interest in this and and um, I wish we had more Dr Kotze, Oscar Kotze's here in Australia because I think where he works we need more clinics like that. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Interestingly, like I know BMI is pretty outdated, you know, it's not including bone mass, muscle mass and frame, but it's still a guide. Like it's still a guide in the literature that we need to have some cutoff point of underweight and overweight. And uh, I, I haven't, don't get this very often, but because I was managing this patient's insulin resistance, she was losing weight and midriff weight to help her skin but that wasn't the goal, but that was the byproduct of what we were doing. And um, her her um, her progress has been slow and steady, but she couldn't she couldn't cope with the change because she kept saying, I haven't been this weight since I was in my late twenties. I go, but it what your body will be will be as long as we're nourished mm. and we're well and you're not underweight. And so it was really interesting just to see how if you've got it all right, your body will reset to be where it should be if we provide the right nutrients, the right menu plan, the right medical treatment, the right lifestyle, the right exercise. Better sleep is another area. Sleep once again. Um, Geraldine, I love how your mind thinks, though, that you're not just going, you know, you've got rosacea, so we'll attack the rosacea. You're thinking, why have you got the rosacea? Yes. It, you know, as you exactly. said, you know, you could blame, you could very quickly blame the, you know, the usual suspects, you know, the alcohol, the, that sort of thing. Yeah. But looking at things like Helicobacter pylori, I, I think there's also a new mm. Helicobacter raising its head from pets. Um, so it's a different species. Um, dogs, wow. I think. Um, yeah. So, but I won't you know, kiss looking that at that anymore. Um, that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but I love your detective mind and how you're, mm. 
you're really approaching the care of your patients from looking about what's happening with that person rather than what yes. they taught you in a textbook. It's a, it's a different right. mindset. It's great. So, so yeah. can we talk a little bit further about your book? Because I like, Ooh. I've got it. Um, this um, for everybody out there. This this is a. It's not a coffee table book. This is a learning book. Like this is, it, you know, uh, like you can get it anywhere between thirty five and forty five dollars. Go to booko.com and choose whoever you can get it from your local bookstore. But but I love how you've set this out because it's. In fact, you know, I'm not going to say it. I'm going to ask you, what was the your reasoning behind the way you set this out because there's a couple of telltale things in there that are really important okay so i suppose firstly i was approached to write a book we knew there was a book in there initially i was going to do one about uh, bowel health funny enough and sell the book in a paper bag but they didn't like it (laughs) so and what we realize is that Everyone does care about, like, if, if something's showing in your skin, you, you don't want that to happen anymore. So, And you don't want to have pimples and you don't want to have all these things. And realising I'd worked in skin health for some time, but really I was working in metabolic health that evolved in skin health. So, for example, if you had any patient with psoriasis, Do you know all patients with psoriasis are insulin resistant? So all the UV light therapies, all the elimination of different vegetables and fruits and nightshades and all that, none of that will be sustainable or long-term outcome without treating the metabolic disease process. So fixing psoriasis saves lives because you're actually fixing heart health, preventing diabetes, and also if you're overweight, by managing the underlying, you'll reset your best weight for you and we'll end up arresting the metabolic disarray that's going on. The other side is that, for example, psoriasis and gluten can go hand in hand. So back to the book, I started realising that if I worked gut health, metabolic health, it all affects skin. So the wrapping my knowledge around skin was the obvious thing to me. And then I felt then if I took people on the journey of understanding about skin, all the conditions around skin, all the nutrients around skin, all the main sort of disease processes that people present to their doctor with, then helping you understand where they could come from and derive from, and then how nutrition plays in with that, To me, it was just a perfect sort of handbook and even a type of textbook that will be able to help people on the journey of helping themselves and even preventing conditions ahead. It's like some people think I can read a crystal ball. Like they might say, Geraldine, I've got high cholesterol. And I'll go, have you got a skin tag? And they'll go, how did you know I had that skin tag under my left armpit? (laughs) You know, so so the the so it sort of became apparent that if if I can just show the journey of how gut health and metabolic health creates that flow through to skin, then we'll talk Mm. about skin. But what you're learning about is metabolic health and gut health. Gotcha. Um, Just quickly, is the level of insulin resistance uh, correlative? concordant with the severity of psoriasis or is there this genetic makeup and there's other um, um, interceding issues of course um, that may play an effect on the expression of psoriasis like can you basically gauge how somebody's insulin resistance is going by their lessening of psoriasis yeah you can actually um because insulin is one thing that is um creating inflammation response but at the same token yes there can be still underlying food sensitivities together with and there can be then even a gluten sensitivity together with and a lot of research has shown that if you tackle all those three things and then I feel that people's psoriasis in general is inversely related to their midriff weight 
So if their waist right. measurement is above right. what's recommended, so if you think of life be in it, and yep. do you remember life be in it ads? Norm. And if you've got, yep, norm, think of norm and the big bulbous nose and and at the RSL club, um, you'll find that, <laughs> no, but you'll find that your midriff weight will be indicative of how much psoriasis you might have. So wow. interestingly, I know, and for the menopausal woman, uh, the same sort of thing because at different stages in your life, that's why you might notice that psoriasis can hit you at different times. Like you don't see often in puberty, but you'll see it more often in the 50 plus year old, 55 plus year old person. It's all directly related to underlying metabolic disease in the family tree time and age precede you, uh, inactivity, increasing midriff weight, poor lifestyle habits uh, would yeah. exacerbate. And when you go looking, then you might be, if you think of the cycle of diabetes, you'll be insulin resistant, pre-diabetic, which is then the impaired fasting glucose or impaired glucose tolerance. Then you might have the typical, I've got a touch of sugar type 2 diabetes and again, people just get told to drop the carbs or eat better or go away and eat properly and exercise, not knowing that this the receptor cells that receive insulin are not now misfiring and they're not recognising yeah. and your pancreas is like revving out like a car and then the, the then you develop the type 2 but insulin requiring. So it's where do we want to jump in? How much of it will be just a lifestyle change initially? So we don't have to directly be metabolic and therapeutic, but that's then when the agents come in. Do we go medical or do we even look at what's out there that can help? So, for example, we had that great talk with Dr. Oscar not so long ago and, and, berber, and berberine and the activity okay. of berberine versus metformin or both, like to actually mm. help to work in together with lifestyle and nutrition. So... Yeah, we've, we um, definitely can see some amazing changes with just some tweak here, tweak there, and then yeah. working with your dermatologist. Because I might get patients that are on immunological um, therapies and biological agents because they're, and they might be walking around with not just the psoriasis on their skin, but psoriatic arthritis, for example, which is no good. And we might have mm -hmm. to no. treat inside out both ways to help two conditions that are coming systemically from one. You know, often patients um, come in to me. Mm -hmm. You go. Sorry, often patients. Yeah, they might come in and they've got, they've come with their skin and next thing you know they're walking out and finding out they're in the diabetes cycle. But then when right. they understand what the driver can be, then together with, then they see the benefits and they see the health benefits. But they're shocked that they've walked out not just with psoriasis, which is what they think they're just coming mm -hmm. in for, which is interesting. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, I, like I want to move on because there's so much more that we can talk about, but just with regards to that insulin resistant sort of picture, do you, mm -hmm. well, actually no, because it is like it's it's relevant for acne, it's relevant for hirsutism, it's relevant for psoriasis, as you've mentioned, um, mm -hmm. and also, you know, whatever else goes along with it, even, even ageing, premature ageing. But um, mm -hmm. do you find that you use tests like, you know, the HOMA IR that looks at insulin resistance or do you stick with things like... Um, you know, not just blood sugar levels, but HbA1c and and you mentioned BMI wasn't very yeah, sensitive, usually, but things like that, the more standard tests. Yeah. yeah, I usually do the whole trifecta. So I'll do home index, I'll do maybe, well, I find the home index may be skewed because some people, their fasting insulin may not show. Often people are already trying to do things before they meet you, so their carbohydrate load may not be there, so it's going to be a false low. Uh, and or right. they might be already drifting into type 2 diabetes and so their insulin surprisingly doesn't look too bad on fasting because they're running out of it. Or you might find that you've got to prep them for the three-day high-carb diet before the GTT with serial insulin levels throughout and that will then help determine how they, so it's like driving the car up a hill with people in the car to see how much 
their body responds to a set 75 gram glucose load and or we can HbA1c or glycated hemoglobin depending on the company. Now the cutoff point for a diabetes uh, is 6.5 percent. Now some uh, companies are now giving you a new diagnosis using the H using the HbA1c as glucose dysregulation where the range might be between 5.5% to 6% and you'll be flagged then as a pre-diabetic with glucose dysregulation. And they'll actually write that on the pathology, but in the box, right. not next to it. So that's why when you're working with your doctor, if you've asked the GP to work in with you to do these tests, you might find that they'll then tell your patient you're fine because it's under 6%. But anything even more than 5.5%, they think it's an undiagnosed dysregulation right. patient on their way to diabetes. So those are sort of the three tests I would do. Uh, yeah. But then also to just for information, like we know CRP, then you might look at liver function and look for other clues like fatty liver or other indicators of insulin resistance for females could be a low sex hormone binding globulin and raised free androgen index and total testosterone, which is the polycystic ovary, raised LH, mm -hmm. FSH, uh, raised LH and lower FSH hormone. Uh, or you might even find you've got a hyperlipidemia patient and their triglycerides are elevated. And that also could be a clue uh, where you may, may then target their metabolic and insulin resistance underlying condition. Gotcha. Um, oh, gosh, this is so interesting. I'm learning so much. Um, one last question before I move on. I just can't help it. Do you ever measure C-peptide? Like I was just wondering then about yep. if you're going to do the HOMA IR and you might get a false yeah. low, the only way to really check that yep. would be as if you checked free C-peptide, correct? Correct. Or And CRP as well, like another information, ESR would be another one right. as well. Yeah. So, okay. yep, I would. Cool. Yep. Great. Yep. Um, now, let's move on because, like, this book, we need to talk more about this book and how you've set it out. Oh, yes. Because like I was going through the recipes and I'm going, I like that one, I like that one, I like like the Moroccan salad, the the, the chickpea, yes. Moroccan chickpea salad. There was the Buddha bowl. There was the oh, Reuben. Yes. Oh, the I Reuben on rye? I love Reuben. I did put a swap in <laughs> um, there though. So you'll see yeah, I'll go yeah, every recipe in there, you can swap to a gluten-free option. So they're all gluten-free modifiable. So there's not just gluten-free though, but there's also vegan options in there as well, right? There um, is. Absolutely. Yeah. So with, so with patients, um, yeah, well, the actual book, this is how the recipes came about. So if we're looking at the best dietary, and you'll see there's a whole lot of nutrition panels in every uh, single mm. recipe, the idea, and you will see the answer there, is that every meal we need to have evenly distributed carbohydrate for breakfast, lunch and dinner. So you'll see what I've done is I've made sure I've kept you in a range. So if I talk in di dietitian terms, one to two exchanges, one exchange is 15 grams of carb, two is 30. So with maybe a variance of plus or minus uh, 10 grams, for example, but I was very mindful of glycemic load, so GL. Mm. And so I made sure there was enough protein there to offset the carb. So if you look at the molecular, the protein and the carb are very similar numbers per serve. And the fat is around 10 to 15. So the formula is that. So I've just given, a, I've just shown you the colour of my underpants. <laughs> no, but um, I've just, I've just revealed it all. <laughs> But the, the formula is what matters, as well as the functional nutrients. And so you'll see I've put like little things, like one of my favourite recipes, I'm going to grab my book that I carefully placed, but anyway, I'm going to ruin the yeah. set. There we go. Smooth that up there. I'm grabbing Here mine. There we go. All right. So I'll tell you my favourite. Which one do you think my favourite Well, which one do you think my favourite oh. one is, Andrew? Just have a wild How guess. could I pick that? There's so many. I don't There's know. You might be spooky and, and pick it. Okay, so stuffed mushrooms, I was re remembering Tammy and Murray Guest providing those beautiful mm -hmm. morsels for my wife and I. So thank you, Tammy and Murray. Um, um, Can you guess Are you it? a lamb lady? Oh, well, my husband's Greek, but not today. <laughs> right. 
Well, I will tell you, my favourite is 157. Have a look oh, at that page, okay. 157. So the that's the salmon warm and salmon potato and salad with sauerkraut. Potato salad with sauerkraut. And the reason why I like that one is because, A, everyone demonises the poor old potato. Now, but the yes. potato is 80% water, okay? It's from the ground. It's rich in nutrients. I've left the skin on there, the little baby potatoes. And I like it because you can actually have these potatoes in the fridge pre-cooked. So you can always grab it, then grab some leftover cooked salmon, some green beans and cucumber and some onions. I put the word scallions because this book was actually put in the UK as well. So we've got to, got to be UKable. And, um, right. and also sauerkraut. And the idea is that I don't know if you know, do you, what, do you, what are your thoughts about potato, Andrew? Do you like potato? I love potato, but in moderation. Yeah. And potato is like... a bit of a magical food because when it was left cold, it actually, when your body then digests it cooled, you actually resistant make more starch. butyrate than, yeah, exactly, in resistant starch. And that's just a beautiful prebiotic to feed your gut. And then we added yep. some sauerkraut to hold hands with the potato as it's being digested. So you got the best of both worlds. So to me, that's quite a functional recipe for gut health and also uh, help your tummy and help your skin. So, And then mm. you've got the omega-3s as well. So it's like one of the most functional lunches you could have as a dietitian. But, but you've also gone through there and provided there was a, what was it, there was the pumpkin, um, it was that, it was like a stack sandwich. Yep. Um, so there was yep, the pumpkin and the leftover chicken I've got chicken a sandwich rice. station. Yeah, because so many people are funny with sandwiches. Am I allowed to have bread? Well, obviously, depending on which bread as well, and we'll work that out. But if you look at the lunch section, I put a sandwich station and nourishing bowls because bowls are all on trend. Mm. And in Good the box. pumpkin section, you're talking about this one, I think. Yep, yep. That's the one. And... Um, yeah, and this is just a way to use your leftover roast dinner. And um, and people sort of think, GG, you've gone a bit far with the carb, but it's still within that balance of protein and carb. And the actual per serve, the carbohydrates only worked out to be 37 and the protein was 40 and the fat was 11. So from a ratio point of view and a glycemic load point of view, we're laughing. It's yummy. And it's good for your skin. <laughs> so, and you get all that rich vitamin A. Well, yeah, that's right. Um, let's also talk though about some accessory nutrients. Now, can food alone heal all of the skin conditions that you've covered in the book? Like atopic dermatitis. You've got um, now. I'm going to get this right. Hydradenitis suppurativi. <laughs> Suppura. I just make it up. <laughs> Yeah. Hydranditis suprativa. Hydranditis suprativa. Yeah. And that's yeah. a horror. Have you heard of that before? No. So I've, think I've, of a I've, pimple. Yep. It's a it's a pimple that's from within. And sadly, people that suffer with this, it can happen in your armpits and your groin area or increases really. And it's like a pimple that can actually have chambers and they burrow in so they can actually become these very underground type wounds and they often people get them drained and they get misinterpreted as an abscess. They can form an abscess but they are mm. still part of that metabolic disease that drives uh, that inflammatory skin acne condition. And it can often be linked with women with polycystic ovary syndrome as well. And so talking about can food actually help heal this condition, I would say it can act as part of the healing process because if we're then identifying we've got underlying insulin resistance, then trying to regulate insulin response with nutrition will only help create a platform for then what the doctors are doing and then if we do add on any other nutrients to help heal. Yep, but yep. without the food part with it, 
it is a slow road. So like we mentioned Prof Bird, Professor Morell's embrace nutrition and skin and finds it very difficult to have people get to the finish line if, if we haven't got the patient doing their job because every time they then start throwing on other medications to switch disease process off. So it's like we're at a volcano level with a lot of patients and we've got to get the volcano to calm down and then we've got to fix the background. If we haven't got this going, then when we're trying to get them out of their heightened acute part of their disease, this will always undo it. And there's only so many treatments we can throw at it. So the, the food plan, yes, will have a significant role and then lifestyle and exercise and midriff weight, metabolic disease. But yes, yeah, so I know it's a bold statement, but definitely. Um, it's like diabetes prevention program. Uh, they found, uh, you know, if, without doing the nutritional part, just putting a medicine to manage diabetes is only one part of the formula. It's, it's not the formula though. So you really yeah, have yeah. to empower the patient. So yeah, so, um, so we we're very relieved to actually have something out there that people can actually get to take on board while they're in their treatment program. But I, I also, just talking a little bit further about that, um, the diabetes work, um, I like the approach mm -hmm. of, like I'm, I'm a nurse, I'm not against drugs at all, but certain drugs have certain common side effects, like for instance, met, for instance metformin, there's a lot of people that suffer from diarrhea. Wouldn't it be great if you mm. could use metformin with berberine, a trophy mm -hmm. restorative herb that has anti-cholesterolemic mm -hmm. and anti-diabetic sort of actions, but also That's helps right. to sort of reduce diarrhea or at least might reduce your dose of the metformin, which again, which right. would reduce diarrhea. So this is the yep, sort you of can definitely, thinking that yeah, I love. Exactly. And you can titrate it. And also too, you don't want to be at maximum dose of medications um, and then we've got nowhere else to go. So then like you say, if mm. you can add adjunct therapy together with to be able to have uh, still the same efficacy without the side effects, absolutely, 100%. So it's like, yeah. for example, I'm astounded. I actually, I, I sat through, um, so with Oscar's last presentation, and I was, I even got up to take a burb of our laughter because <laughs> I, 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 we're talking about, you know, <laughs> how not only does it help glycemic response, but, you know, it actually also helps rid of um and help reduce the helicobacterial pylori, for example, as a therapeutic agent. I mean, I have yeah. patients that acquire clos, clos, um, C. diff or Clostridium difficile in yeah. a hospital setting and the role of um, Saccharomyces boulardii. Like another mm -hmm. doctor I do a lot of work with, I don't know if you've heard of him, Dr. Vincent Ho. He's part of the GI uh, motility unit at the Western Sydney campus and I'm helping in reference to the best nutrition uh, plan, eating plan, as part of management of gastroparesis, which is we're seeing oh, a lot okay. more coming along. And uh, yeah, and he's these, a yeah. fan of Saccharomyces boulardii, working in with management of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. That's a side, that's a situation that arrives from this motility. And you can throw all the antibiotics and urethromycin and all those things to help um, to reset uh, the accumulation of the, uh, the wrong gut microbiome that's creating more symptoms and constipation, yeah, for course. example. And then we just manage the, that bit. So when we, because we still also got maybe damage of the vagus nerve or other things that have happened. Yeah. But, you know, really yeah. being able to create that quality of life for that patient you know, I find is really, really important. And it's like even with antibiotics and say, for example, acne, you'll see in my book, I talk about different strains of probiotics that have been shown to reduce inflammation and in acne. So being able to have that together with, again, the food plan and, and if there is therapeutic treatment. So there's a lot we can do, support nutrition, you know, nutrition plans, working in with the patient and it really empowers them because they feel helpless you know they're sitting there you know yeah. looking at their their doctor with such a horrible skin condition you know wondering how long is it going to take me till I start to get see some health benefit on and skin benefit 
because, you know, they, they can go on some pretty rough treatments, you know, and to be able to see them after and being even weaning off some of the treatments they've had to be on to be able to not see any return of their acne after being on one of those antibiotics is a real, it's a, it's a real privilege and, you know, a great reward for both of us to see that we're able to get them to the finish line. Yeah, you've done really well with this book, Geraldine, I've got to say. I could talk to you for so long, but um, <laughs> we're out of time. But um, just just really quickly, though, as a last thing, it, what what is like one piece of advice that you can share right now for improving skin health? I think we, we sort of already know it, but sugar, if you've got underlying insulin resistance and metabolic health, uh, avoiding refined sugar, that's number one. Number two, do not be carb phobic. We still can eat carbohydrates. We need to eat carbohydrates to fuel our gut microbiome because once we start having a disarray of our gut microbiome, we're going to then start uh, setting off inflammation and proliferate you know, you know, the problems with um, a, a imbalance of, of gut bacteria and then we're going to start oh, yeah. creating a disease process not knowing. Uh, the number yeah. of people that present that aren't eating adequate fibre, so fibre, so we've got avoid sugar, incorporate good carbohydrates, balanced. We need to have good sources of fibre to promote the gut health. And I think also to um, making sure you've got good good nutritional foods, you know, omega-3s, we know that omega-3s are, you know, are proven time and time again to help with uh, reducing you know, that dry skin, those problems with not making the hormones that promote good skin. We know that vitamin C is very important. Uh, vitamin C is very protective. And so we know that also can help reduce DNA damage. So that's very important, particularly with um, fighting, you know, um, you know, the pollutants that we have in this world. I think vitamin E is very important too. I, I don't think I can just name three. I'll just keep going. <laughs> Buy the book. <laughs> but and then the one other. Well, there's obviously so I much think... to talk about. Perhaps we'll get you on the show and we can yes. we can talk about just one certain yes. subset and maybe talk. And, and I'll say on one that. other How's nutrient. I think. Yeah. I think collagen is very important too. I think we've. I think there's a lot of talk about it, and I think there's a lot of research behind it. I'm a fan. I think it's a really a good bioavailable protein and, um, you know, and making sure we've got a really good source of verisol. Uh, you know, that's definitely another nutrient that is very essential yes, for um, promoting. It. That's it. Yeah, I think, you yeah. know, um, I, I know for my patients too, like they're getting, you know, a lot of people getting fit for summer. You know, we want to look after bone health. We want to look after joint health. So getting a really good source of proteins in your diet. So, you know, also fish, you know, lean red meats. Yeah. Um, if you're yeah. a vegan or vegetarian, uh, making sure you're getting good protein swaps as well. You know, tofu, yeah. you know, lentils and legumes. Nuts, Just remember seeds. they're a carb as well. But um, seeds are a good fat, but they're also some protein. But just making sure balance. If I finish with the word balance, mm. I, I, show, I showed you my secrets before about the balance of protein, carb, and a good fat. If you can do that, it's going to help you feel full and happy and help your metabolic health. Well done, Geraldine. And thanks so much for sharing. This You've got a wealth of expertise, but it's also good clinical experience sometimes in exceedingly horrific circumstances and conditions that you're, you, that you're helping to people, you, that you're helping patients to, to mitigate their, their prognosis. So thank you so much for your care and thanks so much for joining us today on Wellness by Designs. Thank you, Andrew. I look forward to doing some more. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Sounds great. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Remember, you can catch up on all the other podcasts and all the show notes from this podcast on the Designs for Health website. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook, and this is Wellness by Designs. 